My name is Meghna Ravi Shankar. I am the Director of Planning here at the World Food Prize Foundation. Over the past few months, our team has worked tirelessly to put together a lineup of speakers who bring out new perspectives, inspire action, and make an impact. We are looking forward to all the insightful discussions that will take place on this stage and hopefully outside of this room as well. We are so honored to have guests here from all over the world, people with a variety of backgrounds, unique insights, and vastly different approaches to their work, yet sharing one common goal, ending hunger. Our theme this year, Peace Through Agriculture, was inspired by the work of Dr. Norman Borlaug, whose legacy we aspire to carry forward. But it is also set forth by the endeavors of Ambassador Quinn, the president of the World Food Prize Foundation. Through his decorated diplomatic career, having served in both Vietnam and Cambodia, Ambassador Quinn has seen the true significance of peace through agriculture firsthand. In recognition of his tireless efforts and tremendous influence in confronting the Khmer Rouge genocide that took place in Cambodia, he was announced as the Aegis Trust Stephen Krillis Champion of Humanity Distinguished Service Award winner earlier this year. While serving as, yes. While serving as ambassador, he discovered the key role that agricultural develop development played in eradicating genocidal regimes. Since then, he has advanced this commitment to peace through agriculture throughout his 20-year career as president of the World Food Prize Foundation. With this year's events being his last before his retirement, it seems only fitting that he would start off the symposium with a few words about his career and, growth, and the growth of our organization. It is now my pleasure and honor to introduce Ambassador Kenneth M. Quinn, President of the World Food Prize Foundation. Thank you, Magna. Thank you so much. I just want to be sure you know about this uh, wonderful young woman. Two years ago, she was an intern in our office. I saw, uh, like almost everybody else uh, who works for me now, in her uh, great uh, ability I hired her to be the director of planning. I'm sure when all these presidential delegates and come, they'll think you're probably about 50 years old and they'll be surprised, but she is just a spectacular organizer and she's put all of this together. And so please join me in thanking Megna for her work. So Norman Borlaug, uh, it's World Food Day. Uh, UN World Food Day around the world. It's Norman Borlaug World Food Prize Day in Iowa. And uh, I'm so thrilled to be opening the Borlaug Dialogue for my last time, 20th time and last time. And I'm so pleased that we have here uh, on the stage the man who brought me to the World Food Prize, our chairman of our foundation, John Ruan III. John, would you stand up? So. Next to him is the man I brought to the World Food Prize, our 2019 World Food Prize laureate, Simon Groot. Simon. Yeah. And uh, we also have 16 World Food Prize laureates uh, here, so 17, uh, including Simon. And uh, we have, for sure, more life-saving achievement gathered in Des Moines on World Food Day than any place else on this planet. So uh, I'm so pleased we have all these laureates here as well. Now next to Simon is Paul Schickler, the chairman of our Council of Advisors. And we also have four new Council of Advisor members who are with us uh, for this event, uh, who are here uh, in the audience and who have joined already spectacular advisory group. So uh, this is we celebrate and remember Norman Borlaug. I'm so pleased that uh, 
His daughter Jeannie and granddaughter Julie are here, and uh, his son Bill will be joining us uh, later today. And so we uh, want to honor uh, Norm with so many different things. One of the things that we're doing to remember his passing 10 years ago is we have a Norman Borlaug Day poster contest. And uh, there is the winning entry from Samantha Reed, a high school junior at Des Moines Christian School. We unveiled it uh, on Monday at our Iowa Hunger Summit. And uh, I think a pretty good uh, job of capturing what Norm was all about. Food, the moral right of all who are born into this world. We make the Borlaug Dialogue a tribute to Norm. It's also the 10-year anniversary of Bill Gates being right here on this stage, announcing all of the major steps he would be taking to uplift uh, the world out of poverty and malnutrition, uplift Africa, a grant to the International Potato Center that resulted in three World Food Prize laureates. Um, and that, so we remember Bill Gates and Roger Voorhees will be here tomorrow to give, uh, along with uh, Gabisa Ajeta, they're gonna be on the stage kind of recreating the moment. Uh, Gabisa was our laureate in 2009, and he and Mr. Gates sat on the stage and had a dialogue about this. Uh, we also have the launching of the Borlaug Adashina Fellows. So uh, our 2017 laureate, Dr. Akinwumi Adashina and his wife Grace are here. As usual, he's brought uh, an exciting group with him. President uh, Olusegun Obasanjo uh, is here. And uh, tomorrow afternoon, the Borlaug Adashina Fellows will be here on the stage and to launch the World Hunger Fighters Foundation. You remember he, at the laureate ceremony, donated his quarter million dollar prize just to doing this. This is the next step in that. We also are so incredibly honored that the President of the Democratic Republic of the Congo, President Felix uh, Shisekedi, is uh, airborne on his way to, uh, to Iowa to be here tomorrow for, uh, for that launch and to uh, join us at our Laureate Award Ceremony. And we have another array of distinguished uh, speakers who will be uh, in our dialogue. Uh, so very, very pleased to have, uh, have them, ministers with us from uh, around the world and uh, international uh, and UN human rights advocates. Plus, we have uh, two award winners with us. Uh, my great good friend, Agnes Kalabata, the former minister of Rwanda, who won the US National uh, Science Foundation Public Service Medal. You know, Marshall Matz is here, he's the one who told me when it was happening, and that so I was so thrilled uh, for, uh, for Agnes. And next to her is Emma, Naluyima, Dr. Emma, 2014 on the stage. She's the smallholder farmer from Uganda who's got a one acre farm and she makes $100,000 a year on the farm with all the incredible things that she does. And uh, I was in Accra this year when she was announced as the Africa Food Prize Laureate. And so I got a chance to give her a big hug and, uh, and she said to me, oh, Ambassador Quinn, you found me. You know, so uh, if only I'd signed up for 10% of uh, what, she's, what she's gonna make. But uh, uh, tonight, we're going to uh, award the Borlaug Field Award at the Hall of Laureates to Dr. Holly Ann Tufan from Turkey, uh, continuing in this great uh, lineup of young scientists under the age of 40. Uh, we had a million dollar grant from Judith Roden and the Rockefeller Foundation. So uh, you have to be there this afternoon. Uh, the buses are gonna load at 5.15. So when Megna comes out and she says, all right, symposium's over, run downstairs to get on the bus. So I know some of you are saying, well, I don't know, you know, at the end of the day, I need to check my emails. So we have built in an incentive for you. Uh, only at the Hall of Laureates will you be able to get the new variety of Borlauger beer. So, come on, you remember in 2014, we commissioned the brewing of Borlauger. I've trademarked the name now. And, that, and uh, so we've, we've gone back, we brought it, just go up to the bar, say, I'll have a norm. And, that, and then later, because I know you'll want more, they'll have it downstairs at the bar in the Marriott. 
So you don't want to be the one who says, oh, did you try the boar lager? No, I didn't go. Come on. Yeah. Yeah. So be over there. And we, and we have a wonderful reception afterwards. It's a great uh, networking chance and to see our Hall of Laureates. This is uh, also the 25th anniversary of the Global Youth Institute, which started 25 years ago in 1994. There's the entire group. 14 Iowa high school students were there. Uh, but interestingly, there were three Nobel Peace Prize laureates. So what a high school youth uh, <laughs> program. Three Nobel Peace Prize laureates. President Jimmy Carter was, was not there for the picture, Mohammed Yunus, and of course, Norman Borlaug. So uh, now, uh, as you'll see at the meals, the uh, Youth Institute's grown a bit. We'll have about 220 students. They come from 10 countries. Our program impacts 10,000 students a year. Uh, we'll have 470 students and teachers who will be here from 26 states. Uh, and uh, it's a terrific program. And when they get to rub shoulders with all of you, that's where the inspiration comes from. It's also the 40th anniversary, speaking of anniversaries, 40th anniversary of the visit of Pope John Paul. St. John Paul II came to Living History Farm. I worked for the governor of Iowa then. I was the security coordinator for the Pope's visit. I was up on the hill, 350,000 people. The Pope gave his message to farmers in rural America. You're the stewards of the earth. Protect the plants, the water, the soil, and use them to feed the millions and millions who are hungry. This is the theme this year around our Iowa Hunger Summit. So if you were here on Monday and you know we had a great turnout, uh, this size, uh, the room was full of people for the Hunger, Hunger, Iowa Hunger Summit. It is the great bipartisan moment where everybody in politics stops for a day. They come together around things that all Iowans agree on, that Norman Borlaug's a great hero, the World Food Prize was his creation, and that feeding hungry people is what unites Iowans together, no matter what other differences that we might have. And uh, we gave another award, our Robert D. Ray Iowa Shares Humanitarian Award to R.W. and Mary Nelson, the founders of Kemen Industries, wonderful, wonderful um, humanitarian, great business people, their business all around the world, so it's such a great thrill to honor them. I want to say a special shout out to uh, President Tim Sands of Virginia Tech University. You know, the Virginia Tech has taken over the Gap Report, such a terrific centerpiece of our side events, along with the CAS Communication Award, the UNFAO, and uh, so President Sands and all the Hokies out there. So this is hard for me. I was a Maryland guy, you know. The ACC, uh, we, uh, but now Maryland's moved the Big Ten, so I can cheer for Virginia Tech again. That I want to thank our media partner, Farming First, and a uh, special thank you to our sponsors. You know, when I came, I had four sponsors uh, that gave about $45,000. Now, thanks to the work of Michelle Hussein, our vice president, we have over 70 sponsors who very generously help us. We have, uh, I want to, so they, my young staff, like the Magnas and Nicole Bereka, and they make me put up the next slide about connecting with us. And, you know, I know it's Facebook and Twitter, and I didn't know what the last one was. I'm saying, what's the last one? I don't want to look dumb out there. So that's Instagram. So, you know, <laughs> what, what am I going to do? So, so this is kind of the opening portion. I want to now invite John. Paul, if you would escort our laureate down to the front row, and we'll move on to our, uh, what you're really here for, the uh, opening keynote address for our conference. So uh, I'm telling you about anniversaries. So this is an anniversary for me. You've heard of 10 years, 15 years, 25 years, 40 years, and uh, this is for me, my 50th anniversary of my career in foreign affairs. So I arrived in uh, Vietnam. You know, I went to, uh, 
I, I dreamed of being a, a diplomat in Europe, chandeliered ballrooms. There's where I ended up, sitting on sandbags. Uh, with these are all the members of the, my, the military advisory team that I led in Duke Tone District. I can tell you everybody's name to this day because of the bond. And uh, I learned there uh, two things. One was that I, was, I saw the Green Revolution begin. I was in the villages when the Green Revolution started. I was, to quote sort of John McCain, a foot soldier in the Green Revolution. And I was a USAID officer. State Department loaned me to USAID. And I learned the Borlaug formula of roads and rice, how they could transform people's lives, uplift them, and then could bring peace. We could root out the insurgency better than anything else we did. And so, 30 years later, when I was ambassador in Cambodia, and uh, you'll see, here I am, I still look the same. I don't have any in, uh, in the next uh, slide. There, there I am on the left with my uh, deputy, uh, Carol Rodley, and we're out uh, with deminers and road builders implementing $13 million of USAID money. And, that, and we built roads into the Khmer Rouge areas, uh, and there were 25,000 of them when we started. And as I left, two months before I ended my ambassadorship, I got a phone call saying, the last Khmer Rouge has surrendered. Thanks to the USAID money, only with that did we, were we able to eradicate the worst genocidal, mass murdering terrorist organization of the second half of the 20th century. So it was for that reason and that involvement with USAID that I wanted to have the administrator of USAID, uh, Mark Green, be our opening keynote speaker. Now he is a Wisconsin guy, went to Wisconsin Eau Claire. I was telling him I used to live in La Crosse, Wisconsin, I went to school in, uh, at Marquette in Milwaukee. He has been a four-term member of Congress. He was American ambassador to Tanzania. He was the leader and president of the International Republican Institute. And now uh, I am so proud as a USAID officer to introduce the administrator of USAID, the Honorable Mark Green. Good afternoon, everyone. It is uh, great to be here in Des Moines. Ken, thank you for those kind words. As Ken mentioned, I grew up just up the road in Wisconsin. I know that people from America's two coasts like to think of all of this, Wisconsin, Iowa, as flyover country. But even they have to admit that every year around this time, the eyes of the world are upon us. So in the brief time that I have with you, I want to accomplish two things. The first is the most enjoyable. I get to help pay tribute to Ambassador Ken Quinn and the leadership that he has brought to this movement. Ken has not only kept Dr. Borlaug's vision alive, but he's mobilized it. And he has helped it to touch countless countries and communities all around the world. He has built the World Food Prize from a one-day event with 30 or so attendees to a week-long attraction drawing more than 1,000 participants from 50 countries. On his watch, the Foundation's educational programs have gone from a couple of dozen Iowans to more than 10,000 students a year from 26 states and 10 countries but as the salesman's voice says in those very annoying TV commercials, but wait, there's more. <laughs> he touched upon it a little bit, but I don't know that people here truly appreciate all that he accomplished long before he ever came to the foundation and to the World Food Prize. Uh, he served in a whole wide range of posts. He was actually President Ford's translator, ambassador to Cambodia, and chairman of the Interagency Task Force, on POWs and MIAs, he's the only three-time recipient of the American for Foreign Service Association Award for Intellectual Courage and Dissent in Challenging Policy. 
I am certain that his time with USAID was absolutely the highlight of his career. <laughs> Actually, it's probably what gave him the gray hair. <laughs> but as I said, there's another reason I'm here, and it is a more serious one. Because the Borlaug Dialogue isn't merely a chance to celebrate progress. It's also an opportunity to draw the world's attention to challenges that will only be met with everyone's best efforts, everyone's most creative thinking. So I'm also joining you today because I want to issue a, a call to action, a call to arms. I want to challenge you, me, everyone I can, to take on the food and economic insecurity issues that are emerging from this area's unprecedented levels of displacement and forced migration. I'm asked all the time as administrator what it is that gets me up at night. This is it, displacement. Families are not where they were and they're not where they're going to be. Nearly 70 million people are displaced in the world today more than any time in recorded history. And I see it as a three-part challenge. On the humanitarian side, we have to find better ways to deliver food and nutrition to these poor people in their time of urgent humanitarian crisis, when they're on the move or in fragile, uncertain settings. On the development side, we have to equip them and prepare them for the economic challenges and opportunities they face on the move and those they will face in their eventual homes. And finally, we must find ways to strengthen the communities whose economies are tested by the newcomers they host. The largest part of this displacement, to be clear, is man-made conflict and tyranny. There's South Sudan where civil war has destroyed so many lives and so many dreams. More than, more than 3.7 million people have been displaced, 4.5 million people food insecure, and 1.3 million children chronically malnourished. There's the tragedy of Yemen. 3.6 million have fled their homes, 17 million are now food insecure, and 7.4 million acutely malnourished. And of course, the, the cycles of misery playing out before our eyes in Syria. But remember, this is not merely an African or Middle Eastern crisis. It's also in our own neighborhood. By year's end, five million Venezuelans will have fled to other countries, driven by Maduro's tyranny and an imploding economy. Of those left behind, more than 3.7 million are food insecure. Nearly 2 million acutely malnourished. For those who have fled, their host communities must work to relieve acute humanitarian suffering, but also integrate them and help them become productive. So I'm proud of the administration's humanitarian leadership. In 2018 alone, USAID contributed more than $3.7 billion in food assistance, helping 68 million people, half of them children. USAID remains the largest contributor to the World Food Program. And thanks to the innovations that so many of you here helped to pioneer, that food assistance is going further, more rapidly, more effectively than ever before. It is saving lives and giving children some hope for a healthier future. Innovations like FuseNet, the Famine Early Warning Systems Network, which provides detailed food insecurity reporting, guides response efforts, monitors signs of food insecurity, so we can intervene long before famine strikes. Innovations like the therapeutic peanut-based pace for severely, severely malnourished children developed by Adesia in Rhode Island. A packet the size of your cell phone contains all the nutrients a child needs. It doesn't need mixing with water, and it even tastes good. Innovations 
like the biometric iris scanning being used in refugee settlements in places like Uganda. A refugee household simply presents its ration card linked via barcode to an electronic database, and then together with an adult's iris or fingerprint scan, they're able to get food. When there's a match, they collect their monthly distribution, and it makes sure that we're able to get the right amount of food going to the right families at the right time. Of course, these innovations are important, but we're gathered here because we know that they're only a down payment on what is needed. Humanitarian assistance, including food assistance, is treatment, not cure. We must develop new technologies and partnerships that will not only assist displaced families in crisis settings, but offer them livelihood opportunities wherever they can find them. We must ensure their plight doesn't sentence them to a life of dependency and stunted potential. I bring USAID's call to action here because there's no better place, no more hopeful place, than here with the Borlaug Dialogue and the World Food Prize Foundation. The choice of Dr. Simon Groot as this year's laureate is proof. It's proof of the power unleashed when ideas and enterprise come together. It reminds us that development progress doesn't come from Washington or Rome or Davos, especially not from Davos. <laughs> Lives are, listed, are lifted on the community level when farmers and families are enabled and empowered where they live. Dr. Groot's East West Seed Company put more resilient, productive, and affordable seeds in the hands of local farmers in Southeast Asia. As a result, food security is rising, nutritional outcomes are rising, and economic opportunity is rising. By applying that same spirit to the challenge of families displaced, I know we can find new answers. USAID will do its part, and today I have several announcements to make which hopefully make that clear. First, USAID will soon launch a major new collaboration opportunity for businesses, NGOs, universities, and others to co-create our next generation of agricultural biotech investments. This new opportunity includes support to critical innovations such as improved seed to help farmers better handle the next drought or resist the next pest invasion but it also includes support to partner countries to develop policies that enable these science-based solutions to be researched, tested, and purchased where they are most needed. We have such faith in what this offering can bring, what the collaboration can bring, that we are expecting to provide more than $70 million in support towards the best submitted ideas. Second, we are launching a new Feed the Future Innovation Lab for Crop Improvement, which will be led by Cornell University. The lab will help develop new seed varieties and ensure that smallholder farmers have access to these innovations as quickly as possible. Third, I'd like to announce our new exciting partnership with MasterCard. It will help farmers access the financial resources they need to invest in their own businesses. MasterCard brings digital solutions and expertise and financial services to the table. USAID will bring a network of farmers and agribusinesses across Sub-Saharan Africa ready to pilot the new finance technologies. Together, we'll help connect rural communities to formal finance and markets, and for many of them, this will be for the first time. Fourth. I'm pleased to announce our latest collaboration with John Deere. Our initiative aims to bring to even more places a successful model of empowering smallholder farmers, especially women. It will facilitate access to the tools, machinery, 
and finance that they need to thrive. And it's true collaboration. USAID will bring our ability to test financing and distribution models, along with our in-country networks. John Deere will leverage its unique equipment and global networks of dealers, lenders, and after-sales support providers. Public outcomes, private enterprise driven. If there's anything that I hope you take from my remarks today, it's that USAID is committed to helping lead and helping to lead in this rapidly changing, rapidly challenging world. My final announcement today is that USAID is reshaping and refortifying itself to take these challenges on. We will very soon stand up a new Bureau for Resilience and Food Security. It will both redouble our efforts under Feed the Future to provide tools that people need to feed themselves and to climb from poverty. And it will make those tools more effective in communities facing crisis by adding resilience innovations. The Bureau will bridge the gap between food assistance, which is humanitarian aid, and food security, helping families and communities take ownership of their lives and livelihoods. Every human being, every community, instinctively wants a hand up not a handout, and USAID wants to help them get there. Final thought. During my first trip as administrator, I was visiting the Somali region of Ethiopia. And one of our events on that trip was to observe a food distribution in one of the hardest hit areas. And I remember walking along a, food, uh, a field watching as sacks of grain were being passed out to families. And I came across a wonderful Ethiopian lady who had just received her allotment. And she stopped me. She said, I have a question. I said, go ahead, shoot. She said, first off, I really appreciate this grain. We need this food. My question is, can you help me with irrigation so I never have to ask for food again? That spirit we all know is not unique to that lady or to that country. It is in the hearts and minds of millions of people all across this world. We owe it to them for our best efforts, our best ideas. We need to put them in their hands and turn them loose. On behalf of USAID, I want to thank Ken Quinn for all that he has done to make the World Food Prize a thing, as my son would say, an event, something not to be missed. And to all of you, thank you for what you've done. More importantly, thanks for what you're going to do in the months and years ahead to help families and communities, especially those affected by crisis, help them grab that brighter future. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah, look at, look at. Administrator Mark Green, standing O. That's it. What a wonderful job. Thank you. So we love to have somebody come and make news.